Thank you all so much for coming on this cold evening to hear Louise von der Breiter, uh, von der Breiter and Bones, Ghosts, and Human Rights, How Science Can Further Justice. We're incredibly indebted to Louise for coming here to the University of Saskatchewan to give this talk, especially because he left Buenos Aires on Saturday afternoon and it was plus 25. <laughs> arrived here Sunday morning, and it was minus 25. Um, I'm not sure if a 50 degree shock is really uh, good for your health, but Louise seems to be handling it very well. My name is Jim Handy, and I'm chair of the Department of History. Um, before introducing um, uh, Louise von der Breeder, I'd like to thank a few people who made this visit from Louise possible. This visit was organized uh, along with the Department of History at the University of Saskatchewan, with the Department of History at the University of Manitoba, and the Canada Research Chair in Human Rights, Social Justice, and Food Sovereignty at the University of Manitoba, um, where Luis will be going after, this, after his visit here. Um, my colleagues at the University of Manitoba have been very cooperative uh, through all of this. Uh, people are laughing because they know my wife teaches it. It's the head of the research chair that, that I mentioned. Here at the U of S, along with the Department of History, this talk was sponsored by, uh, and Luis's visit in general was sponsored by the Interdisciplinary Center for Culture and Creativity, from the Office of VP Research, from the College of Arts and Science, the Humanities Research Unit, and the Canada Research Chair in the History of Medicine. And along with those people who sponsored the talk, there was financial support from the departments of English, Psychology, Sociology, Political Studies, Community Health and Epidemiology, and Archaeology and Anthropology. And I want to thank all of you for doing this. Without your help, uh, we wouldn't have been able to bring Louise here. Now I'd like to introduce Louise von der Breer. Gives me great, great pleasure to introduce Louise to you. Louise teaches in the Department of Legal Medicine at the University of Buenos Aires, but more importantly, and he's more famous for the fact that he's the, one of the founders and currently the president of the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team. In the early 1980s, as Argentina was attempting to recover from the horrific violence, uh, the horrific state-sponsored violence of the 1970s, Luis and the Argentine forensic anthropology team used their skills in forensic science to help recover and identify the bodies of thousands and thousands of Argentinians who had been killed or disappeared uh, during that period. Their work was essential in drawing attention to the violence of the period, the human rights violations of the period. Um, it was essential in, al in allowing them to bring cases for, uh, judicial cases for the violence, uh, for the human rights violations, and essential in allowing families to be reunited with the bodies of their, lo their loved ones. Since then, Louise and the Argentine forensic anthropology team have built an international reputation as forensic anthropologists working in the aftermath of the most horrific violence and human rights violations around the world. Louise has been consulted by such international organizations as the United Nations, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. He has worked with national governments, with truth and reconciliation commissions, with local communities, and with local NGOs in more than 40 countries around the world. His work and the work of his team has been essential in helping thousands and thousands of people deal with the effects of violence, find recourse through judicial proceedings, and work towards an understanding of the history of violence. Please help me welcome Louise von Lieberger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Coming from 40 degrees in Buenos Aires really is a, a shock. 
but I'm very happy of being here and sharing with you some, some experiences in this application of science to human rights investigations. I want to thank Jean Handy, the head of the department for this invitation, and also Rachel Heather, who was the initially they had an initial idea about coming to Saskatoon and to give this talk. The idea of this presentation is to talk about how different scientific disciplines in the last 30 years have been contributing to justice, particularly in cases of political, ethnic and religious violence. How anthropology, medicine, history, pathology, etc. have been helping tribunals, truth commissions, local judiciary and families of the victims to find the remains of their loved ones, to provide scientific evidence in the criminal investigations, and somehow to reconstruct the story of what happened in every country who suffered this kind of violations. But let me start about my country. I'm coming from Argentina, in the south of the continent. We are very well known about Evita Perón, Don't Cry Argentina, Che Guevara, Tango, Good Wine, more recently the Pope at the Vatican. The new star, of course, is this gentleman, Lionel Messi. So I hope after this talk you will support us in June. <laughs> we need a lot of support in Brazil, so let's see after the talk. But at the same time, we are very well known because the human rights violation that happened in my country in the 70s. During our last dictatorship, thousands of people disappeared. And some of the main consequences were to find the bodies of people who disappear in different graves along the country. But political, ethnic and religious violence is something affecting many countries around the world, mainly Latin America, Africa, Asia, Middle East, are running to a place, killing people, destroying the houses, the torture of the victims, the displacement of thousands of people from the original towns to other parts of the country or south of the country, and some of the main consequences of these processes around the world is still going on as is happening, for example, in, in Syria at the moment. The families of the victims, mainly women, have been in the front line from the very beginning asking for truth, justice, reparation and memory. Those are the main concepts we use when we are talking about these kind of processes. Doesn't matter the country, doesn't matter the religion, women have been in the street during the violence and after asking for these things, asking to know what happened with the loved ones, <coughs> if they are alive or they are dead, and also asking for justice to put the perpetrator in jail. <coughs> Latin America has a long history of military interruption of democratic governments, from Guatemala to the south in the 60s, the 70s and the 80s we have military governments, maybe exceptions are Colombia and Peru, different cases, but also with this kind of process of violence. Some numbers of people who disappear in these processes in Guatemala, El Salvador, Peru, thousands of people disappear or have been killed. Torture has been also one of the main patterns in these processes. And still today, in most of our countries, police use torture for criminal cases. In the case of Argentina, we have in the 20th century six coup d'etat. And the last one was in March 1976. As a consequence of this process, who lasted until 1983, between 10,000 and 30,000 people disappeared. In 500 cases, pregnant women were taken to illegal detention centers, and after the baby was born, the baby was taken from the mother and given to military families or police families, and the mother was killed. Usually people were kidnapped, taken to these concentration camps, usually in the military or the police, tortured and killed. And there were around 400 of these centers along the country between 1976 and 1983. What happened with the bodies of people who disappeared? They were buried in cemeteries, thrown to the sea from airplanes, or buried in clandestine graves inside military compounds. 
This was a picture of a typical cemetery in Buenos Aires, Argentina, with graves without identification. The bodies were put in those graves without any name, just a cross. These are the kind of airplanes used to carry the people alive, and then these airplanes flew on the sea and drove the people alive to the water. This is a picture of Argentina and Uruguay and locations where the body were found in 1976, 1977, and 1988. We don't know how many people were thrown by the airplanes. We found only 70 bodies in these years. In 1984, Argentina recovered democracy, and to investigate what happened was a key element in the transition to democracy. The new president created one of the first truth commissions to investigate what happened during the military government, and this commission established that at least almost 9,000 people disappear under the military regime, although the human rights organizations claim 30,000 people. This is the cover of the report called Nunca Mas, Never Again, who relate what happened in that period. In 1985, the justice began to investigate the first uh, governments of the military junta, and after several months of trial, some of them got life sentences. In 1989, a new president gave an amnesty to these people, and in 2000, trials start again until the moment where there are around 600 members of the army and the police under prosecution. But at the same time, in 1984, when we recovered democracy, <coughs> the reality was in the many cemeteries around the country began to get evidence there were many graves in those places. So massive exhumations started in the process without any scientific approach. We had very good archaeologists in the country, very good physical anthropologists, but the forensic people didn't want to incorporate them. They didn't know anything about archaeology or anthropology. So massive exhumations were done without any scientific approach, and thousands of bodies were destroyed and mixed up, adding more pain and more anguish to the families of the victims. So in 1984, the American Association for the Advancement of Science got a request from the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo. It was a human rights organization created by the mothers of those young women pregnant who disappear and the babies disappear visit different centers around the world, asking a specific question to the scientists. It is possible through the blood to connect a grandchildren with the grandparents. Finally, they say yes. And in 1984, this association sent a delegation of American scientists to Argentina. And among them was this gentleman, Dr. Clyde Snow, a forensic anthropologist from Oklahoma, one of the most important exponent of the discipline, who started training us. We were a group of students in 1984, students of anthropology, medicine, archaeology. We want to do something, but we didn't know what to do. We want to help the families, but it was not very clear. So this gentleman told us, I want to perform some exhumations of these graves. I call, he said, the professionals of anthropology, and they say, no, we don't want to help you. So he said, do you want to help us? Do you want to help me? And we say, yes. So in May 1984, under his direction, we produced the first exhumation, scientific exhumation in a forensic case in Argentina. And this gentleman opened a path where today many scientists are involved in these kind of investigations around the world. So we created this organization for two reasons. First the lack of credibility of the official forensic doctors, which in Argentina, as in many countries, are under the judiciary or under the police. So the families didn't trust them. And second, because usually forensic pathologies deal with flesh bodies. And what we found were the skeletons, so they didn't have an act experience. So we created this organization in 1984 with different objectives to provide evidence in court, to assist the families of the victims to find the remains of their loved ones, to train other people, and to promote international forensic standards. 
Our work is related with different steps, related to the, what we call preliminary investigation, we will see later on, the field work, the recovery of the remains, the analysis of remains to provide evidence in criminal investigations and to give back the remains to the families. Who requests our services? Families of the victims, local and international tribunals, United Nations, medical legal institutes, prosecutor offices, etc. In 1986, we began to receive requests from other countries around the world, that, like Argentina, recover democracy or have some kind of peace process, and decided to investigate also their own past. So, a request of those organizations, we began to travel to all these places in one hand to investigate specific cases, and the other side to train local teams in this speciality. Some examples of the training we used to provide to police officers, to archaeologists, anthropologists, to people at the university dealing with these kind of cases. So every context is different. We will see some examples. Every country has their own complexities and their own challenges. It's what we call South-South cooperation. It's not a typical North to South cooperation. We share with them experiences, skills, um, our experience applied in Argentina to another context. From the very beginning, we thought, without knowing too much about science, because science has to be something not inside university, inside our labs. So we have to go out and to make science transparent to the people, to the families of the victims, having a very horizontal relation with them, respecting the cultural and religious aspects, having a relation with them before, during, and after the investigations, attending the dabs, questions, explaining the results, why we say this bomb belongs to this person or not, and also, very important, building local capacity. We didn't want, and we don't want, people depend on us. So we want the, every country with this process has their own team working in these specialities. So going back to the context, as you know, many states around the world, very often under military control, are responsible for these kind of crimes. In some contexts, particularly in Africa, Middle East, Asia, is not only a political conflict, also there is some ethnic and religious conflict which add complexity to the process. Once the violence is stopped, the need to investigate what happened with the people missing or disappear is a very important element in transition to democracy. Human rights organizations, as I mentioned before, the families of the victims have been the main force asking for truth and justice. If I'm talking today here, it's because these families, not only in my country, but in many countries. How to investigate cases of political violence? Different mechanisms have been applied during the last 30 years. Local mechanisms, judiciary, prosecutors, parliamentary commissions, sometimes with external support, sometimes without any external support. Missions, specific missions by UN, European Union, American Commission to investigate specific events in specific countries. Longer missions, usually by under UN, commissions of inquiry like in Darfur, Timor Leste. Truth commissions, have been around 40 truth commissions around the world. Maybe you heard about the Guatemalan truth commission, the South African truth commissions. International tribunals, there are four international tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Cambodia. Some of them are total international, others are mixed, like in Cambodia and in Sierra Leone. Permanent tribunals, International Penal Court from 2002 at The Hague. By communal commissions in regions like Cyprus, or Caucasus, where have been a conflict between two communities, they agree to have some kind of process of investigation. Traditional process of justice, like in Rwanda, the Gachacha, 
where people use this kind of traditional process of justice to deal with the past. And of course, investigation of the truth commissions. All these mechanisms at the same point as science to play the role to investigate a crime scene, to exhume a body, to analyze survivors of torture, to identify the bodies, to establish the cause of death. So the work applied to criminal investigations, what we see every day with all these specialities, is applied in a context where we are not investigating a criminal case, an ordinary criminal case, but a war crime, a crime against humanity, a human rights violation. Every specialist played a role in this context. Today doesn't exist anymore the concept that a forensic pathology has to do everything alone. Today we work in multidisciplinary teams from different fields. And also have been developed of international protocols by United Nations, by the International Committee of the Red Cross, dealing with these kind of cases. So we will focus today in what is dealing with a mass grave, how we analyze the remains, and how we get some results sometimes when we are lucky. So forensic anthropology has been the main discipline dealing with that. It's a very specific discipline, quite new. In 1977, it was accepted at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, the main forensic body in the world. And basically has to deal with the application of archaeology or physical anthropology to a medical legal context where we try to recover the remains, to see changes in the body, identify diseases, to identify the body, analyze trauma, and work in complex cases. So in different kind of cases could be applied. Common or criminal cases, what you see every day in daily life, what I call human rights cases, what we are talking from the beginning, mass disasters, tsunamis, earthquakes, and terrorist cases. Each of them involve a specific strategy, in spite the techniques are the same. So these are typical ordinary crime scenes, one individual, a suicide, a draw, and car accident. These are the complex cases, an earthquake, a tsunami in Thailand, an airplane crash, a terrorist attack, and typical cases of human rights violations, executions, in Cyprus, in Iraq, or in Bosnia. So those are the kind of cases where we deal, when we are talking about the application of forensic anthropology to this specific field. The modus operandi, how the people are being killed. Sometimes there is an open killing of civilians. <coughs> Sometimes the victim is kidnapped and taken to illegal detention center. The person is tortured and the body disappears. Sometimes there is a fake or real confrontation between a state security forces and a guerrilla group. Sometimes the bodies are recovered and sometimes the bodies disappear. This is a usual modus operandi when we're talking about political, ethnic or religious violence. What happened to the bodies? Buried in cemeteries, legal or illegal, in fields, inside military compounds, disposed of ravines, thrown to the sea, volcanoes, or destroy. So we develop an integrated model of investigation for these kind of cases, mixing things from different disciplines. The most important part is what is called the historical investigation. We try to recover and analyze oral, written, graphical, and material sources to come up with hypotheses on the location of the graves and the identity of the victims. They will try to collect what is called anti-mortem information. To identify a body, I need to compare. How was the person when the person was alive? What would I have in the skeleton? Then is the field work, which is the field of archaeology, and then the analysis at the lab to try to identify the remains and to establish the cause of death. We try to integrate these steps that usually are carried on by different specialists without connection. First, we work for the preliminary investigation, which is a mix of history, social anthropology, journalism, and the work of a detective. We try to reconstruct what happened from the detention of someone, and then we find a body in a grave. What happened in the middle could take 
One hour could take two years, different periods of time. So we use written sources and oral sources. Written sources are documents produced by the state. Every state produces documents, different kind of administrative documents. So we try to collect those documents from different kind of archives. <coughs> and also we interview, using the technique of social anthropology, relatives of the victims, other members of the group, witnesses, and sometimes perpetrators. So the objectives of the preliminary investigation are related to this. Who, what, when, where, how, and why to come up with hypotheses which could help us to locate the grain, identify the bodies, sometimes to have information about the perpetrators and a reconstruction of the case. First and all, we need to know the chronology of the conflict we're analyzing. If I'm going to ask a witness about what happened in, in Argentina in May 1976, I need to know what happened in those years in that country. This is an example from Sri Lanka. We need to know the groups operating in the process. This is from Darfur, 2003, in Sudan. We need to know how the country was divided according to different forces in the conflict. We need to know the modus operandi, how the people were kidnapped and taken to different places. Again, this is an example from Darfur, when some villages attacked other people, were taken from one village to another, etc. That will help us to identify gray size and the possible identity of the victims. We work with statements produced in front of truth commissions, lists of victims, names, we need to know who is who. Archives, some archives have been found in different parts of the world, in Latin America, in Paraguay, related to stress there. Sometimes are just official records, like in South Africa, in police stations, related to the apartheid. Or in my country, normal there are certificates with information about the missing people. U.S. secret documents, every embassy, American embassy around the world produce information in those processes. And in the case of Latin America have been particularly useful, the information produced by the U.S. embassies about the conflicts. So after 20 years, 25 years, it's possible to recover part of the information, not all, but there is some important data. In the last years, we incorporate physics. Why physics is related to anthropology or archaeology. So one day, uh, a physicist came to our office and said, how I can help you in your investigation? And we said, listen, we have all these people who disappear. Some of them, we know their political affiliation. With the others, we don't know anything. And she said, let me work with a model. So working with a physics model was possible to put associate people and to understand how people were related according to the area where they disappear, according to the political affiliation. So that's what we call really multidisciplinary approach to the investigation, using all the possibilities of all the disciplines. The relation with the relatives have a key role in the process. We're trying to provide basic information about the work, to facilitate the access to the site where we are working. It's a very important process for them from the psychological point of view. To address their concerns, questions, doubts, and very important to respect their cultural and religious rituals during and after the exhumations. If these issues are not taken in consideration, it could be a re-traumatization of the families of the victims. So for that, we collect what is called anti-mortem information, building a relation of transparency with the families, using a specific forms, collecting DNA information, etc., etc. And we use different databases to put all this information. Sometimes we are talking, in the case of Argentina, about 50,000, 20,000 victims. We manage a lot of data, so we need IT people working with us designing specific databases to process all this information. Then we go to the field work, what is basically archaeology applied to this kind of context. 
As you know, we have testimonial evidence in a criminal investigation. We have a witness, we have documents, could be true or not. We have physical evidence, which is strong evidence in a prosecution. And such a small evidence, we need to work on that with specific instruments. Why is important the physical evidence? Cannot lie when it's proper analyzed. Sometimes it's the only way to demonstrate a case. And it's very important for the judge or the prosecutor, which are our bosses in the investigation. In the field, we have two moments, what is called an assessment of the situation, and then the recovery of the remains and the associated evidence. That is not different than traditional archaeology. The context is very different. In some cases, we can use the assessment. For example, this is a case we work in Congo. We have the authorization to work in this area by UN, but without talking with the leaders of the village, it would have been impossible to work in the area. So this is a combination of how to assess the people, work with them before doing the proper work. Visiting villages, this is the usual kind of landscape where we work. Looking for logistics, security, communications, authorizations. Cleaning the area, very often, almost always, we work with the local population. Visiting cemeteries. An example of an assessment, this is in the Caucasus, particularly in, in Georgia. This is uh, a city very close to Sochi, where the Olympics are taking place at the moment. Maybe you know, in the early 90s, there was a conflict between Georgia and Abkhazia. Abkhazia wanted to separate from Georgia, so it was a conflict, thousands of people disappeared. So we had to investigate several incidents of people who have been killed in the area. So we visit the area. According to the witnesses, in this area were buried several bodies, Abkhazian soldiers. some names in the gravestones, and some information. So we decide to make a little excavation to try to see the stratigraphy of the site, depth of the coffins, the presence of water, and the willingness of the local people and the people who were working in the case. So we make a little hole. We test the depth of the grave. So once we found the coffin, Okay, sorry. We close the area and we plan a longer mission last year. That's what is called an assessment of the situation instead of to start working in the case. Sometimes it's impossible, like in Libya, 2011, August, after the fall of Tripoli, were mass graves in all the city. So it was an emergency plan. We have a lot of volunteers trying to recover the remains, so it was not possible to do an assessment. <clears throat> so people were desperate to recover the bodies from different graves. The crime scenes can change dramatically. Maybe you remember in 2011, there was a warehouse in Tripoli where 300 people were put inside by Gaddafi forces. Around 150 ran away, others remained inside, and they were killed and burned. A month later, the area changed totally. The bodies have been recovered. It was more difficult to investigate the case. Sometimes, because security concerns, we have just five, six, or seven hours to survey a whole area, where at least we can take pictures, interview witnesses, and to produce a map for future investigation about what happened in the region. Bodies can be found in different circumstances. Flesh bodies after a massacre in Rwanda, 1994, or after an earthquake like in Haiti. Sometimes the bodies are in different states of the composition, still fresh, partially skeletonized. Sometimes the graves are secondary graves, like in Bosnia. Maybe you remember Srebrenica, 1995, the killing of 8,000 Bosnians. So the graves were stolen by the Serbian forces, and one body was spread in four or five different graves. Sometimes it was impossible to access to the area, and the remains stay in the spot for many, many years. 
some cases, like in my country, in Uruguay, most of the bodies of people disappear were buried in cemeteries. Sometimes the cemeteries are very well organized. Sometimes are more complex, like in South Africa. So we need to make a history of the cemetery to reconstruct what happened in those areas without any tombstones. In other cases, the bodies are buried in fields, which already have a, an owner. Wells have been used. Bodies dropped to the sea, river, lakes, when also the recovery is complex under the water sometimes. In some cases, after bombings, the bodies remain under buildings. And sometimes we don't have information about the location of the grave, so we need to use all the possibilities provided by archaeology to find the location. And sometimes the situation is really complicated because the remains are all commingled. So the crime scene is one of the most important parts of the world because we have one chance. Something which is done improperly at the crime scene, we cannot modify that. Not all forensic especially have the background to deal with these kind of cases. And forensic anthropologists are the main specialities. When no specialists are working, this is what happens. Remains are destroyed, mixed, using bulldozers, grave diggers, non-specialists. With the destruction of the remains, incomplete recovery. So it's what happened in my country at the very beginning without any scientific approach. So to find the graves, we use different possibilities from witnesses, which are the most important source of information. Sometimes some graves are very obvious, sometimes not, but they provide good information. Sometimes the graves are known by the whole village. Also the children know the location of the graves, so the information provided by the local population is very important. As in Kashmir, these people protecting cemeteries with unknown victims. Sometimes are huge areas without any specific location, like in East Timor. Sometimes through witnesses we can recover the modus operandi, how the people have been executed. And always the local population want to help in these processes. Sometimes we can see some features in the soil, some differences, so using traditional archaeology, it's possible to find some of the locations. We use aerial photography to reconstruct the area. <coughs> this is from my country, for example. This is in the center of the city, according to witnesses. Some people were burned and buried close to the river. And after 1978, the military changed the landscape. But through this, all photograph was possible to reconstruct the area under investigation. Also today, we can use geophysical technology, which helps sometimes to find the remains. In some cases, the remains are on the surface, and we can reconstruct all events. For example, this case, if in El Salvador, 10 people were executed against this tree in 1982, and many years later it still was possible to find the bullets in the tree and cartridge cases on the side. So it's a reconstruction of a past event. In some cases, also after 45 years, when the landscape changed totally, it's possible to do that. In 1974, Turkish invaded the north part of the Cyprus Islands, remove all the Greek Cypriot population, and a lot of people were killed in that process. 45 years later, both communities are investigating what happened, but the landscape changed totally. This was an empty land, and now it's a tomato field. So the owner of this field, this gentleman, wants to have some compensation to allow us to open the grave. So that is part of the process. It's not in the penal code. Nobody explained at, at university how to do these kind of things and the kind of challenges we face all the time in the field in these cases. Finally, it was an agreement, and the man allowed to remove the field to surround the area, and um, the archaeologist working in the area and finding the first remains. 
So every context is different and we face different challenges. Individual graves, when we try to reconstruct the position of a skeleton, for example, this is a normal cemetery in my country. What is different in this case is the position of the bodies. Nobody is buried in this position. So that information gives to the authority some kind of clue about what happened in the event. Sometimes use natural caves. <coughs> the position of the bodies inside the grave. In some cases, we have some order and some respect. In this case, in Guatemala, the families went to the area after the massacre and they managed to put the bodies with some respect in the graves. Or in other cases, when the perpetrators put the bodies inside the grave. So we can recover very small things sometimes, like personal belongings. And also, it is related to the cause of death, like a bullet, in this case, or that's a pregnant woman from my country. The preliminary investigation is related all the time to the field. This is a case we work in Solomon Islands a couple of years ago. We have the information that a man was kidnapped, taken to the jungle, and killed with machete. But we didn't know the exact location of the grave. We have just this story produced by investigators. After opening after open different graves, we see these kind of fractures in the bones that are related to the use of machete. So that allowed us to link the findings in the field with a preliminary investigation. Also about modus operandi, this again from Guatemala. You can see the man with the hands tied behind. But during the preliminary investigation, <coughs> sorry, these kind of pictures were found. It's not the same person, but this demonstrates a modus operandi. And it's very important for the authority to have this kind of physical information. The same thing with other cases. So let me show a case from my country. Tucumán is a small province in the center of the country. Was the only area where we have a rural guerrilla in 1975. And around a thousand people disappeared in this part of my country. So people were taken to a military unit. There have been 350 prisoners and only five survivors. One perpetrator provides basic information, which is deception. It's not a normal procedure. And the judge ordered us in 2009 to start the investigation. So these are pictures recovery by the American Association for the Advancement of Science as US governmental pictures about the area in those years. This is another picture from 1977, where we can see the grace, what we discover later, and a, speci a specific room where the people were taken, tortured, and killed. In 2009, using Google Earth, we see the same sequence. This was the room. This is a clandestine picture taken by someone in those years. So after many, many months working with machines, we found some bones, some burned bones in one of the sides of the grave, some bullets. So the archaeologists start digging in the area. We cover the area. It was a big area with different, different mass graves. So these are showing different burning episodes. So the bodies were put inside, usually people alive or dead. They put tires, goods, petrol, and they burned the bodies for hours and hours and hours in different episodes. These are the tires used to burn the bodies. And in 1978, there are some coins. They removed the bodies. They stored the graves. But the archaeology were able to find the marks of the machines used to remove the bodies. Some of the fragments found in the area, very small fragments of human remains, the analysis. <coughs> a map of the area. So it was possible to recover around 5,000 fragments of human remains, 12 complete skeletons. Some were identified. The analysis continued 
But the trial, which is going on in this province at the moment, was possible to demonstrate the information provided by witnesses with hard evidence and physical evidence. So after the exhumations are finished, we take the remains to the lab for the analysis. An anthropological lab is different than a mortuary. We don't have the composition. We have more time to analyze the remains. This is a normal mortuary where the bodies are taken, are flesh bodies. But with bones, this is not the composition. We can spend more time dealing with them. Sometimes are bigger labs, sometimes are smaller, depends the case and the possibilities. We deal with the bones and all the evidence associated with the bones. The storage of the remains. And we have usually a multidisciplinary team with different specialities working all together in the analysis of the remains from different perspectives. So there is a preparation of the remains, cleaning, reconstruction, x-rays to see bullets. This is a sacrum, a bone from the pelvis of an injury, and the x-ray help us to identify a metal fragment coming from a bullet. Sometimes we need to reconstruct the skulls to see trajectories of the bullets, an entrance, an exit, position of the victim and the perpetrator. And the basic question we need to ask to the judge, is a human, not human, how many people, is a forensic case or not, etc., etc. We establish what is called the biological profile, is the biography of the person, <coughs> sex, age, etc., diseases, and then we try to identify the person, comparing the information provided by the families, dentists, and doctors, with the information we find in the remains. For example, this person has a fracture in the, in the head, and we can see in the bone. We can see diseases sometimes in the bone, who could help us in the work. But the main problem is that most of the people affected by this violence around the world is people without, us, without access to hospitals, doctors, or odontologists. So very often there are no records to compare. So in some cases we have some specific information, but it's a very complex process. So that's why DNA and genetics came to play the role mainly from the early 90s. Of course, it's still, if, if still it's not like in CSI, like in bones. The reality is totally different. It still is expensive. It still takes time and it's not magic. So the analysis of the remains is an integral process where we use different disciplines to have an integral approach to the possible identification. And then to establish the cause of that is the work of the forensic pathology. But the forensic anthropologists, we can assist them working with the trauma, the biomechanics of the bone, dynamics, etc. So let me finish showing one case in El Salvador from December 1981. Possible, the case of El Mozote is the largest massacre in Latin America from the 60s until now. The lady in the picture is Rufina Amasha, one of the survivors of the Mozote, who for many, many years told her story. In December 10, between 11 and 13, the Salvadorian army began a big operation in the north of El Salvador, using different forces, attacking seven different villages. The first one was called El Mozote. Around 1,000 people were killed, mainly children and women. On January 27, 1982, two journalists from the New York Times and the Washington Post arrived to the area. They published these stories. <coughs> And the American government and the Salvadorian government say it was a light. And Ronald Reagan renewed the military assistance to the Salvadorian government. And nothing happened for many years until in 1990, a survivor of the massacre, this gentleman, Pedro Chicas, with the support of the office of the Archbishop of El Salvador, put a complaint in a court in a city called San Francisco Gotera in the north of El Salvador. In 1982, after the peace agreements, it was created a truth commission, and this commission asked my team 
to investigate El Mosote. So this is the area of El Mosote, and basically we say Parquín and Gotera is the area where the massacre happened. So this is a picture taken by Raymond Bonner and Alma Inchalmo Prieto, this American journalist, after immediately a month after the massacre. And this is our first visit in February 1992. It was a, a town totally abandoned. We interviewed witnesses. They show us the gray sides. And it was the main street of the Mosote, how the village was left after the massacre for many years. So the judge ordered us to investigate a small room. It was this was the church of the village, in the top. And that little room with the priest who came every Sunday to get mess, changed the clothes and stayed for a while. So according to the witnesses, this woman, Rufina Masha, all the children from the Mosote were put inside that little room and killed. So the judge also told us, you have to train the local forensic people from El Salvador. So we worked in the Mosote during two months, <coughs> reconstructing this room every day in a very complex situation because the government of El Salvador and the Supreme Court were against the investigation. And we began to find little bones from the children. So the government said they were children because the guerrillas were fighting with a child in front of us to protect them from the confrontation. <clears throat> 143 children were found in the area, almost 200 bullets and cartridge cases. This is a room five meters by seven. We found the toys of the children, the little clothes associated with the bones. So we were able to reconstruct what happened inside the room. We found bullets on the walls. And this is what happened. In the top is some soil, then are the tiles of the roof, and then in 50 centimeters, 143 bodies. And also it was possible to reconstruct what happened. Each circle is the skull of a child, the skull, and the other side in red, the bullets, and in black, the cartridge cases. So it was possible to reconstruct in many cases from where the shops came inside the room. At least in 37 cases, we found a hole in the floor, a bullet, and a piece of bone, which indicate the position of the impact was like this. So this was part of a report of the Truth Commission, it was presented in 1992. And a month later, the parliament in the Salvador declared an amnesty for everybody involved in the massacre. But at the same time, the New Yorker produced a piece written by Mark Danner, who was a how an acknowledgement about which was the attitude of the American government during the massacre. Today, the case is a sentence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights saying that El Salvador has to keep investigating this massacre. And several human rights organizations in El Salvador are trying to remove the amnesty law in the country. So to finish, the recovery of the bodies, to identify them, is not related to the religion, to ideology, to cultural aspects. For all the population affected, it's a very important moment. People want to know what happened, want to put back the remains in a grave, to have an explanation about the findings, to know why we say this body belongs to this person. In this case, if in South Africa, it's about 10 young people killed and explode. So we invite these ladies, the mothers to the lab, to explain to them why we say that a piece of bone like this was the sun, when the last time they saw the sun was full of life, complete, and now it's a piece of bone. So this is the way for us to make transparent the scientific process to the families. So the mourning process is fundamental for the families to be able to put the remains in a cemetery, to visit when they want,
to have some official acknowledgement about what happened by the authorities <coughs> and to provide some closure, not only for the families affected, but also for the community. Thank you very much. <laughs>